This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Uh, I uh, was a resident here from 1999 to 2002, and I've been trying every way I can to make it back. So, so I, I appreciate Dr. Devaskar's uh, um, opportunity for us to uh, collaborate in our developmental behavioral pediatric programs on the fellowship level and the residency level, um, and, um, and uh, for this invitation from uh, uh, Carlos to uh, speak with you guys uh, today. Um, first of all, I'd like to make uh, uh, this statement that I have no disclosures. Uh, I would also like to disclose that I have never been to a Bruin or a Trojan game of any kind, so please don't throw anything at me. Um, we're going to cover uh, these ACGB competencies today, um, and, and we're going to start with uh, a couple questions just to warm up the audience and uh, allow the house staff to make it down the elevators. Uh, so. Uh, Go ahead and uh, punch the button. Are you a general pediatrician, a pediatric resident, a subspecialty pediatrician uh, in the allied health field or the mental health field? And we'll see. This will give me a sense of who you guys are. Okay. And we'll, we'll close it down, 26. Okay. Looks like most of you guys are subspecialty pediatricians. A few uh, residents are here. Um, and it's good to see uh, that we have all the categories that I thought I'd be talking to here today. So now the second question, uh, these questions are just to orient you to the kinds of material that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. Um, High-risk infant development and behavioral outcomes can be predicted best by which of the following? Uh, wh which of these do you think would best answer this question? Uh, gestational age, brain injury severity, maternal education level, caregiver mental health, or all of the above? I think we have around 30 folks. The number keeps growing. Fantastic. We're up to 36 in the room. There's number 37 walking in right now. So, okay. Oh, I can't put it over on you guys. So yes, um, it's important to think about all of these uh, when uh, you're thinking about high-risk uh, developmental and behavioral outcomes. <clears throat> and we'll really get into that uh, because I think uh, most of the literature really focuses on controlling for those other factors. And I'm going to argue today that really we need to think about this being a dynamic process uh, and measuring all these. So good work. Now, how about this one? When can symptoms of traumatic stress be seen in parents of infants in the NICU? Uh, I think this is a, a rarely seen event. Um, only while infant is in the NICU, just in that uh, perinatal period, maybe when the infant is uh, safely at home, these things dissipate. Uh, these things can go for more than a year out, or the symptoms can continue without uh, abatement indefinitely. What do you guys think about this one? Okay. So interesting, yes. So the, uh, the, the research that's been done has looked at this. Uh, we, we, have, we have a competitive group here. <laughs> Keep that going for the pediatric boards. <laughs> we need 100% here. Um, uh, the studies that have been done that have looked at this uh, uh, see these symptoms going out for more than a year. Um, there, it's not E because there's different uh, potential uh, trajectories. There, there can be delayed onset, there can be uh, high levels that continue, there can be um, high levels that abate. Um, and so uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, predetermined that if you have a, a traumatic stress in the NICU that you're going to have uh, symptoms that continue uh, indefinitely. Uh, but they can uh, last more than a year out. So, Okay, so let's look at a case. Um, I saw this case a couple uh, months ago. This is a four-month-old uh, who uh, is X26 week, has a history of spontaneous in intestinal perforation, uh, needed resection, ileostomy, and then closure. Uh, spent four months in the NICU. 
uh, no IVH and regressed ROP. Um, the sort of sequela that they had was some um, a chronic lung disease with obstructive sleep apnea with episodic uh, hypoxemia on oxygen. Um, and the, the real interesting part about this case is the mother uh, reports worrying about his safety uh, so much that it keeps her from sleeping during the infant's sleep periods, day or night. She just wasn't able uh, to um, to be able to relax uh, while the infant was napping or uh, in the evening. Um, and I hate to put this last part on there, but uh, the family had uh, private insurance as well. Um, that's often important to think about during these cases because different systems are brought into bear with that. So, so the last question, what would you do for Scotty's mother? Um, would you reassure her uh, that the infant is stable? Uh, would you refer her to your primary care physician to manage this? Uh, would you explore a referral to psychiatry, uh, recommend sleep medication, uh, or refer to a psycholo psychologist for therapy? Let's see what you guys think about this. Okay. 37, perfect. Okay, so what I'm not gonna do is give you the answer for this one. I will give you, this is, this is the uh, distribution of what you guys thought, um, uh, but uh, we're gonna hold this one in your mind and I'm gonna come back to it at the end of the, end of the talk. Uh, most of you guys thought that we needed to refer her to a psychiatrist for a psychologist for therapy um, and uh, others thought that uh, well, we can take a more uh, 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 primary care primary care approach for her. But let's think about this, and I'll uh, tell you what happened with this case as we go forward. These are the four learning objectives that I'd like to hit uh, today. Let's recognize that high-risk infant parents have emotional responses. Uh, let's predict those emotional uh, responses uh, have effects on the infant's behavior and development. Uh, and then let's translate that to an interdisciplinary infant mental health uh, approach uh, to high-risk infant follow-up that we're doing uh, uh, in our clinic. Um, and let's try to optimize high-risk infant outcomes through clinical care and research. So let's hit the first one here. Uh, what am I talking about when I'm talking about high-risk infants? Well, um, if, if an infant has touched a, a neonatal intensive care unit, um, they're a high-risk infant. Uh, this is about 10% of U.S.-born infants, about 400,000 a year, uh, with an average hospital charge of about $76,000 per infant, and as we know, it can go much, much higher than that. 50% uh, of admissions to NICUs are, are due to prematurity, um, and just that prematurity group um, generate about 26 billion in economic output um, uh, over their lifespan. That means that they, they cost that. This is from the uh, uh, Institutes of Medicine report. 50% of that cost is in the interventions themselves, uh, and about 30% is uh, because of the long-term neurodevelopmental sequela, special education, uh, therapies, et cetera. And then the other uh, uh, bit is uh, from lost uh, productivity uh, because the parents, uh, in many respects, become the, the case manager manager and the, uh, the ones that have to uh, reduce their economic uh, uh, output. Uh, so uh, quite an uh, impactful uh, a group. Um, the rates of prematurity here you can see are coming down slightly, uh, but still hover uh, at 11 uh, percent. And when we're thinking about outcomes uh, in the prematurity group, uh, what's really driving those outcomes is uh, a brain injury. Uh, when you have a, a, a baby that's uh, born early, they're more at risk for brain injury. And also that you're disrupting the, the typical neurodevelopmental uh, progression, uh, the brain development progression, because you're missing uh, that uh, later gestation. Um, as you can see, when you're going from 35 weeks to even uh, full term, uh, there's a huge uh, differentiation that's going on in the brain. Um, and so even, even in that late preterm level, you're, you're missing uh, certain things, a certain milieu uh, that typically uh, develops uh, with these infants. The other uh, potential uh, way to become a high-risk infant is if, if you make it to term, uh, you could also have brain injury from having one of these uh, medical conditions, uh, CDH, meconium aspiration, sepsis, HIE, uh, PPHN, uh, other kinds of hypoxic uh, respiratory failure, uh, and you get some of these uh, intensive interventions, um, uh, ECMO, uh, uh, cooling, ventilatory support, those kinds of things. And this is, you know, these may not be... Um, 
uh, you know, um, that unusual to us, uh, but for families, uh, this, is, this is not what uh, families uh, were expecting. And those, uh, that violation of what they were expecting, uh, you know, they, they recommend let's have a birth plan. How would you like it? Would you like it in the water? Would you like it in the, you know? Um, <clears throat> uh, and so you write it all out and who needs to be there? Is there videotaping going on or not? Um, uh, you interact with the NICU, that wasn't part of the plan. And so emotional responses uh, can be triggered and distress uh, is uh, common. Uh, grief, uh, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. Uh, and that can affect the dyadic relationship, uh, both the attachment and creating what uh, in the past we called vulnerable child syndrome, uh, the parents really holding that child back from being able to interact with developmentally appropriate peers or um, uh, objects because uh, they're, they're vulnerable. And I'm sure you guys are seeing that all over the place. And so I was very interested in this area uh, coming from uh, UCLA when I went to uh, uh, Boston. And I said, well, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, uh, let's look at, uh, is, is this really a factor? Is, is uh, uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms and depression symptoms uh, a factor? And so we looked at uh, uh, moms that were, uh, had babies in the NICU and moms uh, that had babies in the well uh, uh, child uh, nursery. And we uh, looked at uh, both the Edinburgh uh, depression scale and the, uh, the uh, perinatal postpartum uh, post-traumatic stress scale. Uh, and we found this. Uh, that uh, about 23% of the moms in the NICU uh, had uh, uh, significant depression scores, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, had significant acute stress disorder scores, that's the green, um, and uh, you can see the difference there with the uh, depression scores as well. Uh, so that uh, the NICU was kicking off these symptoms, and it was over and beyond what uh, uh, what their prior life had brought them to, and that's the, uh, the number of traumas previous to that. Uh, there was a slight trend for uh, having more traumatic stress events prior to the NICU um, um, in the, the, um, the NICU group uh, versus the well baby nursery group. Uh, but basically what this is saying is that uh, even in the immediate peri uh, peripartum period, uh, moms uh, who have their babies taken to the NICU are experiencing this at a, at a quite high level. So post-traumatic stress symptoms at symptomatic levels uh, uh, about 20% more. Uh, traumatic stress really requires there to be some type of exposure to a trauma. And that's an experience or witnessing a real or perceived threat to life or body or witnessing such a threat uh, to a loved one. Um, and so mothers and fathers that have uh, babies that they go into the NICU, are, are this, you could definitely put that under this uh, exposure to trauma. Uh, that baby was part of you, and now that baby is uh, about to die and needs these intensive interventions. Um, it, it becomes uh, symptomatic when uh, some of these other symptoms come into play, uh, that uh, you can't stop thinking about it. You just re-experience this over and over. Uh, you want to maybe not go to the NICU. Um, if, if your NICU is like our NICU, uh, it's hard to find parents there. Um, and that may be part of what we're seeing with this avoidance symptom. Um, uh, really, I, I need to take care of the kids. I need to go to work. Um, don't really, don't really want to go there. Um, there's also uh, negative uh, uh, cog cognitions and mood, uh, meaning that uh, you sort of see the world in a, a negative uh, way, and you might uh, feel uh, uh, anhedonia or other kinds of low mood. And you also may have this arousal and reactivity, that it's uh, a prominent startle can't get to sleep, like our mother uh, with Scotty's case. All that, if it creates impairment, then you can start thinking about DSM-4, excuse me, 5 uh, um, diagnoses. Uh, but this is sort of what uh, traumatic stress looks like. Um, and when we look at this uh, high-risk infant population, uh, we see uh, greater psychological distress and parenting stress. Uh, we see higher symptoms of anxiety, hostility, and depression. Uh, this has been well published. Uh, these symptoms last uh, uh, to 14 months. I've measured them uh, in the f uh, one to two days postpartum. They go out to uh, at least uh, 14 months. Um, and you also have increased postpartum depression. Uh, uh, in the general population, we're looking at about 11%. Uh, uh, when, you, when you get into this high-risk infant uh, follow-up group, uh, you're looking at uh, 40 to 60 percent uh, could qualify for mild to uh, severe uh, depression. So uh, these are things that we need to be uh, keeping an eye on. Okay, so that's great for the parent. Does this have anything to do with the infant? I mean, we're trying to keep this infant alive. Uh, we're trying to optimize this infant's development. Um, so what do these things have to do with, with that? Well, we know 
that uh, there's lots of outcomes uh, that we see uh, that are non-optimal for individuals uh, who are born premature. I have the birth weights up here. Now we're really talking in gestational ages, uh, but uh, neurosensory problems, uh, developmental problems, learning and academic problems, behavioral problems, all uh, are at higher risk uh, when you have babies that are born um, uh, that come into the world with prematurity or that, that brain injury substrate. Um, and traditionally, the way we think about this is, okay, what are those biological factors that lead to these infant neurodevelopmental outcomes? Uh, and we've talked about these mechanisms before. Um, but to change sort of the paradigm, and I think you guys are, are, are on this with the way you answered that question, um, that those biological risk factors, you can see the, the uh, open triangle and the, uh, the black dot, uh, those birth weight and gestational age uh, factors uh, in a classic study by Wilson decrease in intensity uh, to those uh, outcomes that we see over time. And what becomes more significant is the social factors like maternal education and socioeconomic status. Those become more important over time in really correlating with uh, 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 mental tests in, in this case. Um, so we need, to, we need to think about this paradigm in a different way. We shouldn't be just talking about birth weight and gestational age. We should be talking about what kinds of families are these? Are these high or low risk environment families? And that brings me to thinking about that pathway. How, how does that happen? You have this biological insult, it goes through a caregiving environment, and then that contributes to these infant uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. Uh, how does factors of caregiver mental health play into this? Uh, how does factors of family context play into this? Cognitive stimulation, uh, responsive, sensitive parenting, uh, that parent-child interaction. What, how does, how does uh, socioeconomic status get into the child's development? And it's important to understand that uh, um, to really go beyond a, a bio-driven uh, perspective. We, we do know that biological insult can affect the caregiving environment. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, in fact, even socioeconomic status is a risk factor for having a baby premature to begin with. Um, and that risk factor of uh, socioeconomic status can then play uh, an ongoing role in uh, depressing uh, outcomes uh, as we go. And what we also know is that the caregiving environment uh, has a direct effect on uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. Uh, caregiver mental health problems uh, are associated with infant-child interaction problems. I'll get into that. Poor sleeping and feeding, uh, cognition, and behavior. Uh, so those, those factors do play into uh, what you see uh, later on. And uh, socioeconomic status, as I mentioned, uh, plays into this uh, as well. So if you have um, uh, just labeling a child preterm, this was a very interesting study by Stern, uh, is enough to change the way the parent interacts with, with the baby. So in this study, they, they took uh, preterm and term infants um, and, and mixed up who was labeled full term and who was labeled pre premature and allowed families, to, uh, uh, parents, mothers, in fact, to interact with them. Um, and what happened was that the mothers rated those babies uh, labeled as term more positively than preterms, uh, regardless of whether they were actually term or preterm. Um, so just even that label is enough to uh, create a, a different interaction, a different attribution as to how well uh, the interaction is going. Um, and what we see is that um, Less sensitive, less sensitive and more controlling maternal behaviors are seen at six months uh, with uh, 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 babies that are born preterm. Pre so even despite the label um, or within that label, uh, less sensitive and controlling behaviors are, are seen uh, with mothers towards these, uh, towards these infants. Um, one study uh, by um, uh, Pirmerhert uh, showed that at 18 months, uh, moms who had uh, traumatic stress from having a, a premature baby, uh, higher levels of that traumatic stress were associated with more difficulties with sleep and eating problems. Um, the next study showed, showed that even, uh, uh, even in cognitive performance, you can see a relationship between uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms uh, and lower cognitive performance, uh, even up to about 6% of the variance at 30 months. Um, and in the depression domain, uh, greater rates of insecure uh, attachment, more behavior problems, and low, lower cognitive scores were seen among high-risk infants whose moms were uh, uh, depressed. 
So what that leads me to is that really this biological insult is uh, creating maybe uh, multiple pathways, but at least two. One moves through a brain injury uh, pathway, uh, and the other moves through uh, a potential caregiver psychological distress uh, that then affects that uh, dyadic interaction that then will lead to the high-risk infant follow-up uh, outcomes that we're seeing. Um, and these operate in a transactional way, so that the biological factors and the environmental factors are interacting in ways that uh, we don't fully understand uh, to create these outcomes. To add another layer of complexity, uh, really what we're talking about is an eco-bio-developmental model uh, for human uh, health and disease. And this comes from the early brain and child development uh, group uh, at the AAP that some of you may be uh, familiar with, uh, that really the ecology or the social and, and physical environment uh, interacts with the biology, um, and maybe epigenetics is the way that that happens, uh, and that biology uh, interacts uh, with uh, what the developmental outcomes are, but it also, that ecology interacts with the developmental outcomes, and that ecology affecting developmental outcomes is what often is called a life course. Um, and what the life course uh, looks like um, and they felt that this was the basic uh, science of pediatrics. What the life course looks like, um, and Neil Halfon, if you've had him uh, give uh, talks here, um, uh, he, he ha has really moved this forward, and Milk Cottlechuck and others, um, um, and this is being uh, really advocated as the perspective to use uh, from the Maternal Child and Health Bureau, is that we all have a certain developmental trajectory or potential. Um, and the, the social factors, the social determinants of health uh, either push those uh, uh, trajectories up or down. Um, and so poverty, as you can see, or socioeconomic status will depress that. Uh, but perhaps a preschool program can push that back up. Uh, so you can see these interactions of biology, ecology, uh, and development uh, playing out in a time perspective over time. Again, it's not just the biology that's driving it. It's the interaction of uh, the biology with the ecology uh, as this uh, goes forward. So another study that I do, I've done uh, that sort of uh, makes this, uh, you know, even, even more clear is uh, work that I've done with twin-twin uh, transfusion syndrome. And uh, this is an unbalanced sharing of blood through uh, vascular communications in a common placenta. And about 10 to 15 percent of monochorionic uh, twins uh, are affected with this. And it, uh, it's about one in 3,200 uh, pregnancies. And if untreated, at least uh, 90 percent uh, will have at least one fetal uh, demise. Uh, so uh, uh, I've uh, partnered with a, uh, a fetal therapist uh, who uh, actually uh, cuts these vascular connections with a fetoscope uh, uh, and a laser uh, to uh, stabilize these infants. But uh, one of them is the donor, one of them is the recipient, and they have a unique uh, um, uh, vascular environment, uh, but a common genetic uh, in, um, um, background. And so the question really was, is there, um, is there any uh, difference between the two donors and the recipients, uh, or is there any uh, general sort of developmental delay with these high-risk infants? Um, and so we took about 100 kids from uh, 57 families uh, and found that, in fact, uh, they uh, uh, did have a mean uh, uh, at the mean uh, of the uh, uh, Battelle developmental in, uh, inventory uh, second edition. So uh, there really wasn't a, a decrease in their developmental potential at two years corrected. Uh, but we did find some interesting risk factors. One of the strongest uh, uh, that I think you guys uh, recognized was that lower maternal education. Um, uh, but gestational age, uh, male sex, head circumference, and others really uh, played into that as well. But uh, when, when we think about these things and we put them in models, uh, we, we have to think about them all being factors at, at the outcome. We also found that, uh, uh, also to sort of support my, I, my hypotheses, that uh, parenting stress also is a factor in this. Uh, so that uh, uh, when we, we took the, um, the, the PSI short form, or the Parenting Stress Index short form, uh, it was associated with uh, significantly lower developmental scores in the subdomains of communication, cognition, uh, on the Battelle, 
and accounted for about 8% of the variance uh, in subscale scores, uh, meaning that uh, not, not uh, that there was a direction that, uh, directionality to this relationship, but that parenting stress was associated with lower developmental uh, scores. Uh, you could also see that uh, perhaps maybe if the child had lower developmental scores, that generated more parenting stress, or maybe the parents were stressed to begin with and that created the lower uh, developmental scores. It could be bidirectional. Um, and these relationships are not going to be simple relationships, but we're finding that these are relationships that uh, we're seeing. And also that lower cognitive scores were common among children perceived as difficult. Um, so uh, that difficult factor was playing into um, uh, these uh, outcomes as well. So basically this study uh, gave us the um, understanding that uh, some of these uh, components of the model that I'm uh, suggesting uh, may be, uh, maybe um, uh, we can really measure those and, and see what's going on there. Um, so let's think about how we sort of put this in a clinical context uh, and really translate this to an interdisciplinary infant mental health approach. Um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Jason Wang, who's up at Stanford. Uh, he was in, at Boston Medical Center at the time uh, I worked with him. And he did a, a, a Delphi panel. Um, maybe some of you guys were a, a part of that. Uh, but to really ask, uh, within this very low birth weight uh, a cohort, what are the important things that we need to uh, do uh, to make sure that we optimize the neurodevelopment of, of these infants? And he came up with about 76 different uh, recommendations. And uh, I said that was just too many for me to think about at the same time. So could he, could he maybe like collapse these down to something that uh, we can actually use? Um, and so he said, OK, well, here's, here's 10. And I, I won't go into what those specific are. And you can uh, uh, grab the study from pediatrics if you're interested. But uh, number one, we have to make sure that they're growing. Um, if they're not growing, they're not developing. And so uh, one of the reasons we have a nutritionist on our, our team is because, uh, and, and by the way, the nutritionist is not funded by the CCS uh, system in the high-risk infant follow-up uh, clinic. But we didn't care because growth is important. Um, and even if they're in another special care center, we want that growth to be looked at. Um, number two, newborn hearing. We want to make sure that it's checked initially and repeated. And so we make sure that, uh, uh, that the newborn hearing screen was done uh, and that we check them again uh, at 9 to 12 months uh, as well. Uh, we want to make sure that they don't get RSV. Uh, so Synergis is uh, something that we uh, make sure if they're at risk that they're getting. Um, also, what was recommended uh, by Dr. Wang was a neuromotor assessment, uh, making sure that uh, uh, someone like me is you know, checking the tone, checking the uh, unilaterality of uh, any motor signs. Um, we also want to make sure that there's a developmental evaluation that's going on, uh, and then that's repeated as well. Uh, luckily, within the CCS system, uh, there's funding to be able to provide that uh, assessment as well. And we also want to make sure that they can see uh, so that follow-ups with uh, ophthalmology are very important. Now, for my field as developmental behavioral pediatrics, I'm very sad, but there wasn't a lot of recommendation or support for psychosocial screening uh, beyond substance use and demographics. Uh, and so I want to redouble my efforts to provide some evidence base for that piece of it, because uh, basically everything I've told you up until now really argues for those being factors in those outcomes. And I think it just hasn't been studied uh, to the same degree as these other factors. And so what we've done is put together an interdisciplinary team. Uh, again, the CCS system allows us to, uh, a funding to be able to do this at a, uh, at a low level. Uh, but we have a physical therapist or occupational therapist uh, doing those developmental assessments. Uh, we have uh, some uh, grant funding to uh, bring, a, bring in a uh, psychologist that really focuses on the traumatic stress and depression aspects uh, of the case. Uh, we have a nurse coordinator, a nutritionist, uh, and myself as the developmental behavioral pediatrician. And that's what surrounds the family. Uh, we're really approaching this as a family perspective uh, because one of the best models out there for looking at high-risk infant outcomes uh, is the developmental systems approach by uh, Mike Gurlnick uh, up at, um, uh, up at the, um, you said, in uh, Seattle. And he really conceptualizes good intervention programs uh, to be able to address these three levels of uh, the system, if you will. Um, we have to know where the child um, uh, brings to the table. Uh, what is the social and cognitive uh, competence of that child? We have to be able to assess that and work with the family around that. 
we have to be able to look at the family patterns of interaction. How does that family interact with this child? Um, what kinds of other resources is the ch uh, family bringing to really support that child's development, uh, like child care or other uh, family members? And then at the bottom here, what are the family resources that can support the family providing uh, that uh, learning environment or that uh, successful uh, caregiving environment for the, for, the, for the child? So if the family's in poverty, if they're not connected with uh, SSI, housing, uh, food stamps, et cetera, uh, that's going to limit the family's ability to support the child's competence. And so if you think about uh, uh, high-risk infant follow-up intervention programs or the work you do along these three domains, uh, it can be helpful to really optimize uh, that child's um, approach. So in the clinic, um, this, is, this is what we do. We have um, everyone orients the family to the uh, uh, clinic. Uh, there's vital signs and measurements. We have used the Bailey scales. Um, uh, I uh, do my uh, neuromotor assessment based on the Emile Tisson. Um, we uh, have just trained our nutritionist and psychologist in the NCAST, uh, which is a, a nursing assessment of how that dyad functions. Um, there's both a teaching domain and a feeding domain, uh, but uh, there's like 74 uh, different uh, uh, observations that can take place during a brief uh, feeding interaction uh, so that you can see how well the dyad is uh, interacting. Uh, we also uh, have uh, formal screening tools. Um, uh, like the uh, Edinburgh and the perinatal P PTSD questionnaire. Uh, and then uh, the, the idea is to really connect with other uh, um, uh, audiology and ophthalmology and other supportive services, either in mental health or regional center, uh, to support uh, this family. So let's, let's get real concrete with what, uh, what you guys can do uh, to optimize clinical care. Um, and so what, uh, again, I know there's a, a fair amount of... Um, uh, subspecialists in the audience, but you can think about these things. Uh, I, I always want to make sure that there's a there's a medical home, uh, a primary care doctor that's uh, that's really pulling all this together. Uh, without that, you can't uh, you can't really make uh, make the best uh, intervention possible. So I'm always asking about who's your primary care doctor. Are you regularly seeing that doctor? Um, but for for you guys, really understanding what the history elements are. One of the things I see is that is that uh, uh, these, these high-risk infants graduate, um, and somehow they lose their prematurity, they lose the fact that they had ECMO, uh, it just sort of goes away. Um, and uh, primary care doctors or others will uh, not be correcting for their gestational age, uh, often will transition them to uh, term formulas uh, in the first year uh, if they're preterm. Um, somehow the prematurity evaporates uh, when they graduate. Uh, Risk never graduates. Uh, those risks continue, um, and um, and so that we have to we have to really pay attention to the history uh, from a long term perspective. We also have to make sure, uh, as as clinicians, that uh, we're checking the vision, hearing, and weight gain. Uh, that you do the neuromotor exam, and that we engage in screening. And I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, so f as far as the history goes, thinking about prenatal risk factors, uh, what happened in the NICU course, what happened uh, post-discharge, what are the chronic issues to follow, uh, what are the follow-up needs that the, the infant has, and uh, we put this in a, a contemporary PEDS article. But again, these risk factors in that prenatal, they, don't, they just don't go away. Uh, if you're born uh, extremely premature, that risk factor is, is a lifetime risk factor for you. Um, and so... Um, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, you know, the third bullet down here, 50% you're not gonna, I'm not gonna see in our high-risk infant follow-up clinic uh, that CCS funds till uh, three years, I'm not gonna see a measurable disability. That doesn't mean that they've graduated. Uh, that doesn't mean that that risk factor has gone away. Uh, deficits often emerge due to the increasing developmental demands of childhood. Um, I cannot check a two-year-old's uh, reading ability. I cannot check a two-year-old's math ability. Um, their uh, executive functioning is not something that I can assess at those ages. When they get to school age, uh, when they get to adolescence, those uh, slight uh, deficits, maybe there's a visual spatial problem that's, that's often common with these, with these infants, maybe then that uh, uh, learning problem will, will uh, come out. Uh, so you always have to have at the back of your mind that that risk is there, 
uh, and you have to be um, watching for that and referring. For instance, uh, ADHD is something, not something that I can uh, diagnose at, at two years of age. Um, and there's four times the risk within this extreme uh, premature population for ADHD. Um, again, we don't make it at two. Um, you might see people making that at two, but we really shouldn't be doing that. Um, and we shouldn't be giving stimulants to, to two-year-olds either. Um, but they're at higher risk. Okay, what about on the other side, uh, on the late, the late preterm, the 34 to 36 week olds? Uh, again, I showed you that the brain development hasn't really moved forward completely, uh, and, and new studies that are coming out are showing developmental delays, about 36% risk. Kindergarten suspensions, these are because of behavioral problems, 19%, and more behavioral problems at, at eight years, including uh, all these other um, uh, medical risks uh, that are, are seen as well. But just because you're late preterm, doesn't mean, or, or you ne maybe you never touched a, um, a NICU, uh, doesn't mean the risk wasn't there or that you've graduated uh, from that perinatal period. You're at higher risk. And so greater vigilance, greater screening should be part of what you do. The first screening, from my perspective, is to make sure that the parents are doing well. And so I, I, I collaborated with Dr. Heinen and Mounts on, a, on some uh, clinical recommendations uh, for what we should be doing um, in, in the units um, to, to screen for depression and for post-traumatic stress. And uh, there's two of the items that, uh, uh, that um, uh, we recommended, uh, the, the patient uh, health questionnaire two. Are you guys familiar with that one? Okay, some of you are. You can use it in primary care as well. Uh, and then the perinatal uh, post-traumatic stress questionnaire. And let me just show you what those things look like. Um, this is what the PHQ-2 is. This is recommended by the um, uh, U.S. Preventative Task Force um, uh, for general uh, depression screening, uh, but I think it, it, can, it can apply in this setting. Uh, so over the past two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? And then the second question, uh, have you felt little interest or pleasure in doing things? Uh, that, that can be a very nice way to uh, engage the family on depressive symptoms. Um, Again, I've had uh, conversations with infant mental health experts that really feel that a more targeted screen, screening uh, uh, tool like the Edinburgh uh, may be even better in the, uh, in the postpartum period uh, and for the first year. Uh, but at minimum, uh, broaching the subject in a formal way uh, can, can be very uh, important. And then this is what uh, the PPQ looks like. Uh, several bad dreams, that's part of a re-experiencing, upsetting memories, uh, uh, sudden feelings that your baby's birth was happening again, avoid thinking about uh, childbirth, that's avoidance, uh, et cetera. Um, well, we were really thinking that it would be important to do this um, uh, uh, early in the um, uh, early in the NICU stay so that you can um, uh, assess for potential risk and if there's a prolonged uh, uh, experience in the NICU to do it again uh, at, the, at the time of discharge. Um, Again, these are going to flag uh, potentially at-risk uh, individuals for having these uh, um, uh, mental health problems uh, that then will influence the uh, baby's um, uh, development later. Uh, one group that's really pushing this forward uh, is the Los Angeles County uh, Perinatal Mental Health Task Force. They're primarily focused on um, uh, maternal depression screening, but I think it also uh, will uh, uh, I'm going to try to push them to thinking about uh, post-traumatic stress, especially with these high-risk infants uh, who have had uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, traumatic uh, exposures uh, for the parents. And then for primary care uh, uh, screening, uh, the two main ones uh, are the, uh, the PEDS and the ages and stages. Are you guys using the PEDS or the ages and stages? The PEDS? Um, so there are different, different ways to go on this. The, the PEDS, again, is a, uh, um, a parental uh, concern report. Um, uh, do you have concerns about X, Y, or Z? And the ages and stages are more milestone-based uh, uh, tool. Uh, either one uh, is, is good at picking up uh, potential developmental issues. Um, there's some more examiner-administered uh, uh, tools uh, that maybe go beyond what primary care uh, has time for, and then behavioral uh, uh, tools as well, like the MCHAT, uh, the MCHAT-R now, um, and uh, the pediatric symptom checklist is a, a good one as well. And then my favorite, uh, the Vanderbilt assessment scale. Um, 
I was embarrassed uh, to uh, be giving my same shtick on that uh, with Mark Woolrich, uh, who came to visit us, uh, uh, who actually developed that tool. Um, he, he made sure everybody knew that I actually did not develop that tool, that he developed that tool while he was at Vanderbilt. So, and that's really picking up uh, ADHD symptoms. And, uh, um, and as you know, it's much higher with uh, high-risk infant uh, uh, outcomes to have ADHD. The other thing to think about is the uh, early intervention system, referring to regional center, um, and either for um, uh, things, uh, at least uh, I've seen a report from, um, uh, from uh, Ventura County that they're liberalizing their inclusion criteria again, um, and I'm hoping that uh, the Westside Regional Center for you guys will be uh, doing the same. Uh, to really bring in uh, less delay to be able to get services, uh, but these are the, uh, uh, and, and to bring back the at-risk categories. Uh, Ventura, at least, was bringing back the at-risk categories, and um, I have not seen nice publications uh, from the other regional centers to announce that that's happening, but um, it should be happening because uh, that's what the state's doing, so. Now, there's also prevention and treatment programs to think about. And so, um, uh, are you guys using kangaroo care? So, uh, that, that's one, uh, one potential way to, to mitigate some of these uh, caregiver risk factors where there's skin to skin contact and really helps the uh, parent uh, sort of uh, begin to understand the, the state of the infant. NIDCAP is another. Um, uh, again, uh, these, these programs, uh, Girlnick uh, uh, comments on these in, in the article from 2012. Uh, um, there's, there's variability in the, the excess, success of them. And, and, it's, and from my perspective, it's because not enough uh, 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 work has been done to really say, well, what is the family that I'm dealing with that these programs are being applied to? Are these higher, low-risk environmental samples? Um, are we really putting the parent first? Are we putting the child first in these uh, uh, situations? Uh, NIDCAP is about teaching the parent uh, how to recognize state and autonomic control and attention and other uh, uh, factors. You're teaching the parent to respond to the infant. Um, the same is true for the uh, mother-infant transaction program, which is a, a NICU to home program. Uh, again, it's how to make the parent more attuned to the child's uh, 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 regulation and state um, and to improve that parent-child dyad. Um, and then there's more uh, global programs uh, that are home visiting programs that uh, for psychosocial risk and for other risk has shown uh, positive uh, outcomes. Uh, and the Infant Health and Development Program is another that shows positive uh, outcomes from a home visiting uh, program. There's also a curriculum involved with that. But all of these are not trauma informed. And that, that's another thing I'd like to argue today that um, if, if, we, if you agree with me that this is a potential traumatic stress event uh, for these families that can kick off depression and post-traumatic stress symptoms, um, you need to think about moving through a trauma-informed uh, perspective. And uh, work that's been done by Richard Shaw at Stanford uh, has used a trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy approach with infant redefinition. So he brings in some of this, uh, how does the parent uh, better uh, become better attuned to the child's uh, state and regulation, uh, but there's also a component that focuses on the parent's uh, responses to having this traumatic uh, event uh, happen um, and their feelings and how to reconceptualize that. Um, he's shown some positive uh, outcomes to six months, uh, but I think, I think uh, th this, feels, this feels like that may be uh, a key factor in this. Uh, in addition to the, the psychosocial risk, the high-low uh, environmental risk, thinking about a trauma-informed perspective I think can uh, be very helpful. Uh, another perspective that, that we're really thinking about uh, is a uh, child parent psychotherapy and how that may apply uh, in medical traumatic uh, uh, environments. Uh, this is, is usually a year's worth of therapy, but maybe there's some elements of that that can be really applied to uh, post uh, ICU environments. Uh, ch child parent psychotherapy is about not not focusing on the parent or the child, but thinking about the relationship as the as the key uh, ingredient for improving uh, that system. And so, uh, how to how to improve that relationship is uh, is the key to this. Attachment 
moves into this. Um, some of these factors of uh, the parent responding, but also how the, what the parent brings, the ghosts in the nursery that the parent brings. Uh, and this has been used with domestic violence and some other things by Alicia Lieberman up at uh, uh, San Francisco General Hospital. So I think these two approaches uh, are uh, the trauma-informed way to approach uh, uh, this uh, going forward, and I think I think that may enhance the outcomes that we're seeing. Uh, on the on the basic prevention side, uh, the March of Dimes has recommended these potential steps uh, for reducing prematurity. One of the main uh, drivers of our high risk infant population: so eliminate early uh, cesarean deliveries and inductions, um, reduce multiple embry embryo transfers uh, for ART, uh, stop smoking. Uh, provide progesterone supplementation to high-risk pregnancies and also cervical cerclage. So uh, if we can prevent prematurity from occurring, then we don't set the infant up for, for having the brain injury and we don't set the family up for having the, um, uh, the traumatic stress reactions and the depression and traumatic stress symptoms later on. But until we can fix prematurity, and you may be able to fix prematurity, but can you uh, uh, protect the infant from having uh, uh, deliveries that are uh, uh, traumatic uh, with HIE or with uh, congenital anomalies and some other things. Um, those families are going to um, come into the assist these systems and they're going to have these reactions. So future research uh, that I'm going to do uh, is going to look at these factors um, and uh, measure these factors um, uh, uh, prospectively and longitudinally to really give us a good sense of what these outcomes uh, are and uh, how they come to be so that we can apply interventions uh, uh, and hopefully trauma-informed interventions to uh, optimize uh, uh, high-risk infant follow-up outcomes. So, Back to Scotty's case. This is our four-month-old who, whose mother uh, was really not able to, to sleep. Most of you guys thought uh, this is outside your bailiwick. Uh, let's refer them to the, well, not most of you. Some of you suggested let's go back to the primary care doctor. Others su suggested uh, the psychologist um, for uh, therapy. Uh, what happened with this case is uh, what the mother told us is that she did talk to her primary care doctor. Um, the mother was referred to an adult psychiatrist. The adult psychiatrist heard that she was having difficulties with sleep, prescribed sleep medication, um, and so she didn't really want to take it because she was worried about her infant. Um, and so this person was addressing the symptoms when you really needed to get one step behind that. And so when we uh, talked to the mother and we had our infant mental health uh, folks there, uh, we went ahead and referred uh, for uh, further dyadic uh, assessment and therapy uh, because, because that was really the etiology for what was going on. You could, you could help her sleep, she'd feel better or not because she was, may, may feel even more guilty because she uh, uh, was not able to be awake and make sure her infant was, was doing well. But it really was that anxiety, uh, the trauma of having that infant uh, that was creating the post-traumatic stress symptoms that needed to be addressed. Um, and so uh, referring on to a psychologist for dyadic assessment and therapy is what, what we did um, and what I had hoped that the psychiatrist would do. But uh, even with that, uh, I think when we're talking about infant mental health, uh, this, is a, this is a new field uh, for, for a lot of folks. Um, and bring, from my perspective, if I can bring that into the, the medical world, uh, we can, we can short-circuit this process and get families to where they need uh, ASAP. You guys have uh, a very mature uh, trauma-focused, medical trauma-focused uh, environment here with Dr. Stuber and uh, Birch, and I think uh, uh, bringing them in for cases that, uh, uh, that, that uh, hint of this is uh, really important. So uh, to summarize, uh, high-risk infant parents have increased stress that lead to worse outcomes. Uh, clinically, an interdisciplinary infant mental health approach uh, can address some of these family needs and hopefully optimize uh, uh, outcomes. Again, we need to study this. Uh, so ongoing research on contextual neurodevelopmental outcomes will guide further assessment and interventions. So with that, I'd like to show you my lovely daughters, Caitlin on the left and Eleanor, who just had her birthday yesterday, on the right at two. Uh, and I will end. So thank you very much for your attention.